Discord. I'll begin with a word of prayer. I think it's time to start. So, ahem. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Ahem. 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 I whistle, but I really can't. Anyway, <laughs> dearly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for the weekend again, just completed. And I uh, just pray you be with us today. We thank you, Lord, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank you that we are made in your image. We have the ability to create and understand uh, just a shadow of what you can. But uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've created us a universe that we can understand, Lord. And we just pray that you'd help us to do what we can today to be a little bit closer towards that goal, Lord. You know I pray. Amen. Um, okay, so today, curves and surfaces. Now, on the, on the syllabus, I just have curves, but I, it occurs to me, I'll try to do a little bit of both. And uh, so, of course, again, we have, we have two, let me just draw a, a, a kind of a big picture, a big picture of where we're going with all this. There are kind of, uh, let's see here, you got curves, surfaces, and you have the parametric viewpoint, and you have the implicit viewpoint. All right? So just to kind of just give you a sample um, of each, a typical parametrized curve would be something like this. Um, R of t is equal to, gee, I don't know, cosine t, sine t, um, three. So a uh, parametric curve is described by three functions of time, one for x, one for y, one for z. Parametrized surface, goodness gracious, it could be something like this, r of, uh, let's say, um, r of st equal to, I need myself a little more space here, Cosine s, sine t, sine, um, ah, I've lost my track. Oh, sine s, sine t, and then uh, cosine t. So a parametrized surface has two parameters. A, param a par parametrized curve has just one parameter, all right? Now, the implicit, the implicit viewpoint says you don't give a par parameter for the object. You define it in terms of equations in x, y, z, all right? Um, so the way to describe this curve, and I'm going to describe the same uh, curves I just gave the param parametric view versions for. I'll give you the, 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 the implicit versions for in the, in the box below. This you can check. So let me just, you know. This is x, right? This is the y, this is the z. And likewise over here, right? x, y, z. You can check that, in fact, if you look at those functions of time defined by x, y, and z, like I'm saying, you can check out, it's easy to prove, that x squared plus y squared is equal to what? Yes, sir. Sine s, sine t. The y part is supposed to I agree with everything except for the arbitrary part. These okay. these serve a purpose, which is that I can easily find the Cartesian equations, because in fact I know and love these parameterizations from my previous experience with calculus three. In fact, this is just a circle. It's a circle at z equals to 3, a circle of radius 1 centered about the z-axis. You can easily verify that x squared plus y squared is cosine squared plus sine squared, and that's 1. And what's the equation for z? That's easier. Z, z equals 3, right? So what you're looking at there is the right circular cylinder intersected with the horizontal plane z equals to 3. What happens when you intersect a cylinder with a horizontal plane? Yeah, you get, a, you get a circle. So that's, to describe the circle with equations, I need two equations. So process of elimination, if I start with three, three free variables, I need two equations to break it down to just one free variable. One free variable is a curve, right? 
In contrast, a surface has two free variables, which are the parameters, s and t. So I only need one equation to get a surface. And it's not quite as easy, but it's not too hard to see that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. See, because if you add x squared and y squared, you have a residual sine squared t. And you get cosine squared s plus sine squared s, which reduces down to 1. And then you add that to sine squared t. And then you get cosine squared t plus sine squared t. Excuse me, sine squared t plus cosine squared t, which is 1. So in fact, this is a sphere, the unit sphere. So that's the big picture of where we're going. We want to talk about curves and surfaces. We can either talk about them parametrically or implicitly. And we'll, we'll go back and forth between these viewpoints as we go on, OK? So now that I've showed you the forest, let me show you some trees, OK? So let's talk about curves in two dimensions. There are, um, you know, we already did lines, so I won't talk about those. But you can talk about a circle, right? Circle, center what? Center, say x naught, y naught, and um, radius r, what's that look like? This is the Cartesian equation for that, right? How would you, how would you parameterize it? So the, the parametric equations, basically, you just say, OK, well, I'm going to make this behave like r cosine t. I'll make that behave like r sine t. And if I do that, then I'm good to go. I see that it motivates this x equals x naught plus r cosine t, y equals y naught plus r sine t. Those are the scalar parametric equations for a circle with radius r and center x naught y naught. Hopefully you know this already. What if I made it an ellipse? What would the equations of an ellipse look like here? Let's see here. x minus x naught squared divided by a squared plus y minus y naught squared divided by b squared is equal to 1. That would be my go-to formula for an ellipse, which is centered at x naught y naught and has semi-major and semi-minor axes a, a and b. Well, radii, I don't know what they're called. It's, it's um, plus or minus a from x naught in the x. It's plus or minus b from y naught in the y, right? I could draw it. Like this point up here would be um, x naught, y naught plus what? Plus b. This point over here, for example, would be um, x naught minus a comma y naught, assuming a and b are positive, which is generically what I do, as to not be annoying. All right, so how would you parameterize this? Yeah. Just do the same substitution. The same substitution, right? I, I, I kind of agree with you. But and so if you understand that, then you understand him. Um, but what he's saying is think of this as being cosine squared theta. Think of this as being sine squared theta. Or, or you could use t. I'll, I'll use t just to be boring. And if I do that, that suggests that I like what? I, I let what? I let x minus x naught over a equals to cosine t and y minus y naught over b equal to sine t. In other words, the parameterization would be something like x is equal to x naught plus a cosine t, and y is equal to y naught plus b sine t. Those will be nice parametric equations for an ellipse. 
centered at x not y not. So far, so good? What if you had a hyperbola? What about hyperbolas? So I can, I can pretty easily make these into hyperbolas. All I do is this. I put a minus here. Right? Then what I want is, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to do that because it will create chaos in your notes. <laughs> let, me, let me just not be so lazy. But if you don't mind, I'm going sh to stop doing things at a center. I'm going to start doing things centered around the origin. You've seen the how to deal with a non, you know, if the center is at x not y not instead of the origin from these two, these two things. So we can, we can now, you know, um, <clears throat> here's another example. Basically, suppose I have x squared minus y squared equals to one. I want to parameterize that. So the key here is to recognize what it is. It's a hyperbola, right? And then, so I'm like, aha, well, I know that cosh squared t minus cinch squared t is equal to 1. Show of hands, who has no idea what I'm talking about? Just a few, OK. So in other words, I didn't have calculus 2 here, right? If you had calculus 2 here and you didn't see this, I'd like to know about it. Because I have someone to talk to. Oh, it's been a couple of years. OK, so sidebar. The exponential is equal to 1 half e to the t plus e to the minus t plus 1 half e to the t minus e to the minus t. I think we can all agree about that. I just added 0. But this expression is important because it expresses the, the fact that the exponential can be decomposed into an even function plus an odd function. All right? The even part of the exponential is called the hyperbolic cosine. The odd part of the exponential is called the hyperbolic sine. So this is cosh t, which is an even function. And this is sinh t, which is an odd function. Just while we're on this short tour of hyperbolic functions, cosh t is like a goal. Uh, it's basically like x squared plus 1, except it's got exponential growth on either side. So it gets really, really tall really, really fast both ways, coming and going. The smallest that cosh t is ever is 1. So like cosh of 0 is 1. That's absolutely the smallest that cosh gets. Otherwise, it's larger than, it's, it's larger than 1. Cinch is kind of like a cubic, um, except it does like that. And so cinch of 0 is 0. And that's the only hyperbolic sign um, which hits 0. 0 goes to 0. That's it. Otherwise, it's non-zero. And again, it's got exponential growth on both tails. This is cosh and cinch in a nutshell. The fundamental identity, for while well, ignoring, of course, the exponential is cosh plus cinch. The other identity, which you, you should know, um, which is important, we use all the time, is cosh squared t minus cinch squared t is equal to 1. It's sort of the analog of the, um, you know, the Pythagorean identity for sine and cosine, but this is the analogous thing for hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. Now, the, the reason that these are called hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine is really the example I'm about to give you. I'm in the middle of, in fact, right? So sine and cosine parameterize circles, like I just showed you. Hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine parameterize hyperbolas. See, because cosh squared minus sin squared is 1. So what's the, what's the parameterization then? So there you go. Those are the parametric formulas for the hyperbola. Those are the scalar parametric formulas. What, what's the vector, vector parametric formula? Some people would say, well, what you wrote isn't right either. You should really say x of t, not in y of t. Fair enough. But so r of t is what? it's. Um, cosh t, cinch t. See, these, goes to, these go together. They're, 
they're connected and that vector points you to a point on the hyperbola for each value of time. Does this cover the whole hyperbola? Like what, what is this actually? What is, what is, what is the graph of that hyperbola work, look like, by the way? It's got asymptotes, y equals plus or minus x, right? Those are the asymptotes of the hyperbola. And which way does it go? Let's see, if I put in, if I put x equals to zero, I get y squared equals minus one. That's really hard to solve with a real variable. So apparently, the graph does not include x equals to 0. Where is x equal to 0 in this picture? So the graph does not include x equals to 0. That means this is a sideways opening hyperbola. It goes like, like this. So my point to you is I have just parameterized this piece of it. Although I'm not really done yet. What do I, the thing I haven't emphasized yet today, and I really should, is parametric equations are not really complete unless you give the range of the parameters, right? So what range should I give for the parameters in my initial big picture thing? What would suffice? How about 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 2 pi? That would do it. And um, for the second one, you could let uh, 0 be less than or equal to t, less than or equal to pi, and 0 less than or equal to s, less than or equal to 2 pi, as we'll learn later this week. Okay. Now th this one here, you can just let t be what? t be a, just for t a real number. So the domain of this parameterization would be all reals. That would do it. Now that, that, that doesn't get the whole hyperbola though, does it? Because what did I just, I, I got done reminding you, hyperbolic cosine is what? Cosh t, in other words x, is greater than or equal to 1. So I'm giving you a parameterization for the right branch of the hyperbola here. How do you get a parameterization of the left branch? Right, because the, the algebra allows for both of these, right? The, the equation x squared minus y squared equals to 1 has got the red and the green curves. Yes? Ex uh, well, yeah, um, that would work. That would work. What he said would work. So minus cosh t is, is an essential. Um, now, you're right. Why I could put minus sinh t, but my inclination would be just to do this. But I mean, that's just a choice. Now, so he, he's, he's, he's like, I could put negative sinh t there, right? And if you think about it, you could actually replace, I mean, there's nothing really stopping me from putting minus sinh t here either. But the difference, so if, as they're currently given, in the green and, and in the purple up here, these parameterize the curve in such a way that the y is increasing. So it's, it's like this, see, because dy dt is cosh t, cosh is always in, uh, cosh t is, is always positive, right? So in fact, you're traveling upward. On the other side, the also like this. Now, if you, if you did that minus, that would be fine, but that would be the, the formula for parameterizing it flowing downward instead. So hyperbolas, we use cosh and cinch. And if you understand this example, you can do any other one that involves a hyperbola, pretty much. All right, so you should have already seen many of these things in calculus, too. I'm not going to belabor them here. Let us get back to three dimensions. So So let's just look at an example. This one, r of t equals to t, t squared, t cubed. This is known as the twisted cubic.
it, if I can hazard a picture of it, it's something like, so it's, it's growing up and what's it doing? It's dx, um, let's say 0 less than or equal to t less than infinity. So it can just keep growing and growing, right? So I don't know. The, um, you know, how do you plot such a thing? Well, without technology, you kind of just have this choice, right? You put t here, and you put your, um, you know, your formula over here, and you just start plugging in values and see what it gives you. Zero. How about one? How about two? How about three? So you see it's growing in the z much faster than it's growing in the y. And it's growing in the y much faster than it's growing in the x. So it's, but it's, it's something, <laughs> I can't draw it worth anything, but it's kind of like, <laughs> I, I can't draw it. <laughs> okay, but maybe you can picture it. Let me give you something I can draw a little bit better. R of t equals to cosine t sine t, t. Um, let me throw in some constants. Let's put an r here. Let's put an r here. And let me throw in an m over here. Where r and m are positive constants, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll suppose 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to, let's say, 4 pi. To visualize that, um, well, of course you should use Mathematica. I mean, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Or you could use Sage, or you could use Maple, or you could whatever. MATLAB, sure. I mean, let's not get crazy. I, yeah, OK, fine, you can use MATLAB. Um, I don't really care what you use, but use something. Um, now, but I personally, you know, so suppose I don't have technology. Perhaps it's after the robot holocaust. The computers are evil. We can't trust them. So what do we got to do? We have to think for ourselves, right? So I see this. I say, OK, well, x squared plus y squared is what? R squared, yeah. And then you got cosine squared t plus sine squared t. In other words, it's just r squared, as you guys told me already. So this curve is wrapping around a what? A, a, yeah, it's, wrap, it's a, like a circle, but there's no z there, right? So that's a cylinder in three dimensions. x squared plus y squared is a cylinder around the z-axis with radius 1. So if this is that cylinder, the curve is stuck on there, right? And then what else do we have here? Z is equal to mt. So if we think about that, what's that say? That says that z is increasing linearly with time, right? So it's just it's just just kind of just going up at a constant rate. This is so I can I can try to picture that. Where does it start? I need a starting point. What's r of zero? Yeah, r zero zero. So that starting point is basically here, right? And then also, by the way, this means that it's wrapping like counterclockwise. I mean, you could think of t as being the standard angle, essentially, right? Behaving like the standard angle of polar coordinates, and it's just so it's it's going to be like this. It's a helix with, with two, two coils of a helix. Usually, if I talk about a helix, it goes on and on and on forever. And that's easy enough to get. You just don't limit t 
to be 0 to 4 pi. You just let it go on and on. And then this is the, the parametric equations for a helix. Be like, what's the... Now, here, here would be a nasty question. Describe the helix like this. Right? A circle wasn't bad because it's the intersection of the cylinder and the z equals 3 plane. The helix is the intersection of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And what? Something, something awful. Something called a helicoid. Okay, but, uh, So the point is, don't describe the helix as the intersection of two surfaces. Describe the helix parametrically because it's its happy place. It's how you should describe it, right? Okay. Let me go remind myself of what it is I forgot to tell you. Ah, level curves. Do you guys know what a level curve is? No? Let's see here. So we need to talk about what's a level curve. <laughs> okay. I've actually kind of already got it up here. So this whole discussion was what? It was an, a three-dimensional discussion. All right? If you were in n dimensions, it would be more it would be different. Well, the parametric part of it would be the same, but the implicit part you'd need more equations or less. Um, so in R2 there's, you know, we, we can, we can discuss, uh, if you look at f of x comma y equals to some constant, let's say c, then this defines a level curve with level function f. Okay? Um, in contrast, if I look at, say, so, uh, you know, a level curve, to be more specific, it's something like this. It's x comma y in the plane such that f of x comma y is equal to a constant, all right? That's the level curve. Let me, let me come up with a different symbol for it. Let's call this level curve um, script c. So this would be script c, the level curve. In contrast, I could talk about the graph of a function. The graph of a function f of one variable, right? That would be the set of ordered pairs x comma f of x, such that what? Such that x is in the domain of f, right? So of course you've spent a lot more time thinking about graphs of functions probably than you have thought, spent about thinking about level curves. But these are two different ways we can look at curves in the plane. Now. They're very different though, right? So for example, we could have x squared plus y squared equals to 1. You guys know what that is. In the plane, that's a circle. Wait a minute, you're like, I thought you just said that was a cylinder. That was a three-dimensional con comment. It depends on the context, right? In three dimensions, x squared plus y squared is a cylinder. In two dimensions, x squared plus y squared equals to 1 is a circle. Right? Is this a graph? No, this is not a graph because it fails the what? Vertical line test, right. So on the other hand, if you have y is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared, that is in fact the graph of a function, right? This is equal to the graph well, excuse me, the collection of all points that satisfies that equation, right? That would be like the top of this circle. So um, locally, um, level curves can be 
written as graphs of functions of either x or y, but globally there's usually some trouble. This is all accounted for in something called the implicit function theorem, which you can study in advanced calculus when you take it. But um, for us right now, it's just that we have you know, another way to look at curves. We can either look at curves in terms of basically an equation, that's the level curve viewpoint, or we can look at curves in terms of a graph, right, y equals f of x, or we still have also one other viewpoint, which is what? The parametric viewpoint, right, which is a curve is something like r of t, which is you know, x of t, y of t, right? such that you know, um, t is an element of the domain of the parameterization. You have these three viewpoints for describing curves. Yes, sir? Well, it's a very big difference because here I'm saying it's the points which solve this equation. Here I'm saying you plug in t, that gives you the point on the curve. So it's the difference between saying x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared versus x is equal to r cosine t, y is equal to r sine t. The difference is one of description. As point sets, there's just this geometric thing called circle, right? And so you can either describe it parametrically or you can describe it implicitly. Or you could describe it in terms of a collection of graphs. See, the, the notion of graph is somewhere in between. You can easily take a graph and convert it to either a parameterization or you can convert it to a level curve. <clears throat> You're like, well, why don't we just talk about parameterizations or just talk about the other well, we need both viewpoints in order to you know, be able to tackle all the different questions which come our way. So, so <clears throat> what I was just talking about, you know, the connection between the, uh, these different ideas, suppose you're given you know, x, y, and a graph. that says that y is equal to f of x, right? So how would, I, how would I capture that in terms of a level curve? Big F, what level function should I use to get the same set of points? It's kind of silly. I need to essentially take this and convert it to an equation. There are really just two choices. Subtract f of x from both sides or subtract y from both sides, whatever you want. You guys choose. Subtract y? Okay. So f of x minus y, that equals to zero. You see, if this condition is met, that means it's on the graph, right? But this is also the level zero curve of the big F defined like that. An ex example of where you would use it. Sure. Example, you could be talking about, for example, the voltage function, right? And the voltage function might be something like, I don't know, x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. And then your level curves. <laughs> what are your level curves? You know, let's suppose that this is 10. Well, that's an ellipse, right? Which I've described as a level curve. And the meaning of it, it's a set of points in the plane with voltage 10. It's an equipotential. Or it could be a, like a, if you want to think in terms of you know, uh, gravity, you could think about it as in terms of like a topographical map. 
you know, the level curves can actually represent distance, altitude perhaps. Another good example. But this would be very awkward to describe using graphs, right? Because to describe it in terms of graphs, I need a set of graphs for the top half. I need a different set of graphs for the bottom half. It's awkward. So any, any graph can be converted to a level curve. Not every level curve can be converted to a graph. At least only locally you can do it, OK? Um, now, what about, you know, so th there's how to get from the graph viewpoint to the level curve viewpoint. How do you get from the graph viewpoint to the parametric viewpoint? Suppose I want to describe the same curve using a parameter. What do I do? If I want to trade a graph for a parameterized curve. Right, I need x of t and y of t. And if it's going to be the same curve, it needs to be such that when I plug those formulas back into the equation for the graph or the level equation, whatever you want to think about, um, it works, right? So it's just, I'll get you started here. Suppose I put t here. What do I need to put in the other slot in order to make it work? What's that? f of t, yeah, exactly. Because then, if we have x is equal to t, then we have y is equal to f of t, which is to say f of x, right? So it's on the graph. So sometimes I'll even use x as the parameter in this case. So it, it's a very silly thing, but you can always take a graph and convert it to a parameterization just by using the, uh, the x coordinate as the parameter. This becomes more exciting when we get to three dimensions, but the story remains the same. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, you sure. when you parameterize or put in parametric form, you're setting one as variable, setting the other as function. When we put it in parametric form, we have to declare how each of the Cartesian um, coordinates depends on the parameter. So we need one function for each Cartesian coordinate if it's a curve. Right? If it's a surface, then each Cartesian coordinate needs a function of two parameters, because we need two parameters for a surface. But we don't talk about surfaces in R2, so I'm getting ahead of the story. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. How I got more than, oh, well, I'm talking about the, the getting different level curves corresponds to choosing different values for the constant, the level, if you will. This is the level C curve, right? So here I'm showing you the level 10 curve. As you adjust, if you set this equal to different constants, you get different curves. Sure. Indeed. Oh, the question was, are, is that comparable to families of graphs? Well, yeah. We, we're, the difference is there's a very, very profound difference, though, right? Graphs which are related by vertical shifts are just, you just take the curve and like shift it up and down, right? You get the, but you get this foliation, this, this uh, dividing, parsing of the plane into a bunch of graphs, right? One on top of the other. You notice that the plane is parsed in a very different way by, by level curves. Yeah, as I look at different levels, I get different curves, but they're not related by vertical shifts. They can be related in all kinds of crazy ways. So the concept of a level curve is far more general. It allows for much richer geometric content in your curves. And the graphs are very boring. They have to pass the vertical line test. It's very boring. But on the other hand, it's calculus one, so it's our happy place. Sorry. OK. Let me show you some pictures. Now, of course, I would like for you guys to read my notes, if you don't mind. I mean, I've got something like 20, 25 pages on these things I'm telling you, right? So I've just showed you bits and pieces. You just should read it. If you, if you have me tell you all of it, it'll be very boring. It's, um, it's better for me to forge ahead and try to leave more time to answer your homework questions when, you're, when you get to them later this week. OK, that's, my, that's why I'm taking the pace I am right now, because um, I know we'll want time later to look at homework. So come on. Oh, yeah. Georgia R. Martin, a song of ice and fire series, after Benioff read a game.
I've been listening to the radio from this, this uh, radio station out of Wichita Falls. It's a lot of fun. They've got this restaurant out there called Taco Casa. They have the most awesome commercials. Where do you want to go? Taco Casa. No, it's like, do you want burgers? No. Do you want pizza? No. And then the little boy's like, I want to go to Taco Casa. And then it's just, oh, it's just great commercials. I really want to go to Taco Casa. They're, they're very effective commercials, apparently. Could somebody get the, uh, the try to close those blinds if you don't mind? Because otherwise it's very... So in some sense, everything I said about lines and planes um, was a precursor to this. What do graphs of, what, do, what is a graph of a, can you, is it, is it getting it or do you need me to fuss, fuss with it? Because it's, yeah, I mean, if you can, I hate talking about stuff people can't see. <laughs> Let me fix it. <laughs> it's the vertical pan is a pain. I think it's just, this thing. Well, it's not curses. Oh man. Can we just to tilt the stand back? Uh, yeah, I guess you'll have to. <laughs> oh yeah, you can adjust the legs maybe. Oh, oh, I have a lower tech solution. I have a lower tech solution. I'm gonna. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna pan it down. <laughs> you leave it where it is. I'll just. I'll just not be an idiot. Well, I'm going to try. Come on. Ah! There. <laughs> now you can see it, right? And you should be able to see it too, right? OK. So. If I want to think about a graph of a function of a, of a three dimension in three dimensions, what does a graph look like in three dimensions? There's the one standard one we look at is for a function of two variables. Oh, don't worry. This is not the last time we're going to talk about level curves. Like we have whole other classes where we talk about them and look at the calculus of those and, and try to understand how the gradient relates to the levels. And that's that's the start of a discussion. It's not the end of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> So graphs in three dimensions, though, we have our standard go-to is z is equal to f of x, y. Right? So the graph of a function of two variables is something like the set of triples x, y, z, such that um, x, y is in the domain of f, and z is equal to f of x, y. So roughly speaking, I picture that something like this. I'm not trying to draw the domain right now. I'm just trying to give you a sense of it. So a typical point on the graph has the form x, y, and then f of x, y. So the graph of a function of two variables gives you naturally a surface in three dimensions. Okay. But there's two other kinds of graphs you could think about. You could think about a graph of a function of x and z. Or you could think about a graph of a function of y and z. Those are, those are other graphs. But the thing that makes a graph a graph is essentially it's based on two of the Cartesian coordinates and writing the remaining one as a function of those two. Okay? There's, um, and it, 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 from one viewpoint, it's a very special kind of parameterization, right? From another viewpoint, you could easily convert it to a level surface, right? You just do something like the level function is z minus f of x, y. Or for this one, the level function is y minus g of x, z. Or for the h, the level function would be x minus h of y, z. That would 
give me a way of looking at these graphs as so-called level surfaces. That said, and again, I'm, I'm not the last time I say this. It, it won't be the, it's just the first. I want to show you our standard list of, I'm getting there. Come on. So here's my curves. Uh, here, here, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing slightly, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to do it. Here, here's an example of a level curve. <laughs> level curves can kind of be awful. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a level curve. I forget the equation for that, but I mean, you can write equations to get all kinds of crazy shapes. It's just a matter of tinkering. The people who make it their profession are called algebraic geometers. They probably would take offense to what I just said. All right, anyway, let me get, get out of these curve examples. Come on. I probably should have zoomed out before I went down. I'm going down at a stupidly slow speed. There's all kinds of examples in here. Surfaces are two-dimensional, right? Here's a graph of a... I don't, I don't try to graph surfaces in here too much, except for some standard ones, and I will show you more about how to do that systematically as we go on here this week. But um, here's a graph. Z equals e x times e to the minus x squared minus y squared. That looks something like this. Now, these pictures, you should understand that the, uh, the color is based on the z level. This is called z hue. This is created using something called maple. You can use Mathematica. We have it for free. If I get enough time, I will um, bring you the mathematics sheets, which Dr. Wang has graciously created this summer. Um, here's the, oh, hey, hyperbolic cosine again. Here's z equals minus the hyperbolic cosine of x times y. It looks like this beastly thing. So it's kind of like a plane up here, and then it just kind of <laughs> down in every direction. Um, you can always ask questions about domain, right? Like, how do you find the domain of a function of several variables? It's pretty much the set of all points where the formula makes sense. It's the same song and dance as before, but we'll, we'll let's see here. Well, I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow. What I wanted to show you was not these. I wanted to show you some other examples. This is, a, I believe, a trifoil knot. Forget, but there's, there's. This is a surface, um, the, the level surface that actually has. There's a hole out the back, a hole at the top. It's kind of like one of those connectors you've seen. Maybe you've seen like a connector where four things come in together. You you might have this as a technic piece. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So this one is the sphere. So what I, wa I want you to, as, as I've got this out here, I w there's just a couple things I want you to get from this several minutes I'm going to spend here with you on, on, on this, which is that most of our standard examples involve just quadratic expressions in x, y, and z, all right? But a difference of a plus or minus makes all the difference. So here we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared essentially equal to a constant. That gives you a sphere or more generally an ellipsoid. What happens if you take one of these pluses and make it into a minus? It makes all the difference in the world, right? So here's the next, the next example is with z being a minus. And then I look at different, level, different levels of that fu level function. So if I set this equal to 0, that gives me the cone, which I actually don't have pictured. Um, on the other hand, if I put the level being minus, so if I have x squared plus y squared pl minus z squared equals to like minus 1, that gives me what's called a hyperboloid of two sheets. Then as you go to zero, the hyperboloid of two sheets, the two sheets get closer and closer and closer together. When you hit level zero, it becomes a cone. And then as you go and do levels, positive levels, like this, oh, I'm pointing off the screen, aren't I? had excellent reviews. It's like awesome horizontal pan. I, I think I didn't think about the fact that we also need vertical panning. Oh well. Those were like several hundred dollars. This thing cost us 50. So, oh well. 
you guys don't care how much I spent on the tripod. I don't know why I'm telling you this. But anyway, this equals to a positive constant and gives me a hyperboloid, so-called hyperboloid of one sheet, which it looks like a cooling tower. Um, but my point to you is, you know, just through different sums of squares and differences of squares, we get all kinds of really neat different shapes. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, both the level surface viewpoint and then also how do you parameterize these things using sine, cosine, hyperbolic sine, and hyperbolic cosine. That's it, pretty much. So thanks, guys. Oh, don't forget, homework.